All right. Hey, fun to be with you. Good morning still. All right. I promise not to get you out by lunchtime. Deal? Yeah, right. Very enthusiastic. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Al, did I hear you say that you taught on being a Bud Light or a Bug Light? Oh, my goodness. Because I wanted to open up with a beer story. Now, I don't drink beer, but I talked to a guy who did. This session, we're going to talk about connecting to the world. I want you to understand that as a Pentecostal and evangelical Christian, you are predisposed to be disconnected, not connected. You have too many barriers. I have too many ridges between the world and me. Somehow, that phrase in the New Testament, come out and be separate, has been driven into our generational DNA, and the only time we talk about Jesus is with other believers inside the box. And we are incredibly uncomfortable talking with people because for us it's all or nothing they've got to be ready to go to the cross and we'll pray them in the sinner's prayer or we totally ignore them we are unaware that god works in steps to move people forward there's a scripture i believe it's in mark chapter 12 where jesus talks to a priest and here's what he says to him you are not far from the kingdom of God. I want you to hear those words. Because Jesus identifies that this priest is not in the kingdom. But he's not where he used to be. We would say he's in process. Do you understand what I mean when I say people are in process? You and I have to be in process. There are some of you in this room that are very, very comfortable being in a room full of people whose eternal destiny is more dark than light. Four-letter swear words do not put you off. Who they slept with over the last four weekends does not turn you away. You are very comfortable in that kind of conversations. But for the most part, that's not most of us. Most of us feel great pause in situations like that. We're not comfortable with the language. We don't really know what to do. Well, I have good news for you because you are being coached 24-7 by somebody who lived there their entire life. His name is Jesus, and that's where he wants to take you. It's exactly where he wants to take you. I pulled up in front of Starbucks. A man came out in front of me. It's obvious that he was panhandling. He wanted money. I normally don't give money. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't. But if they want something to eat, I'll buy them. Or from Starbucks, I'll get you coffee. And I knew he wanted something. And I got out of my truck, and he's about six feet away. And I said, uh, can I help you? He goes, yeah, can I get a couple of bucks from you? Let me just be straight up with you, man. He said, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm coming off a bender, and I am in terrible pain right now. And if you could get me a couple of dollars so that I could go to the convenience store next door, the Chevron station, and just get one beer, it would take the edge off, and I could probably make it through my day. And I went, well, and, and all my AG stuff started coming up. <laughs> I know what to do. The guy's being totally honest, very transparent, authentic, all the values that we ascribe to. But he's asking me for something that I just am so value conflicted and I said well I can buy a cup of coffee he goes, oh, I could never drink coffee I'm sick man I said how about some food he goes oh no that's even worse he said seriously just a couple of bucks and I went okay his honesty deserved that so I gave him a couple of bucks and he walked away and you know what I felt like I'd won I felt like I had won. I'd conquered the cultural barrier. And I felt pretty good because most of the AG guys I know would never give a guy $2 to go buy a beer, and I felt pretty good about myself. Okay? 
I had connected to my world. I was doing well. And then I got in line waiting for my coffee. And I was feeling so good, I decided to talk to Jesus about it. Thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. I just pray you work in that man's heart in this quiet moment because prayer is two-thirds listening and one-third talking, right? In the mirror, you look at your face, you have two ears, one mouth, that's the key. And I hear Jesus say to me, I'll never forget it. Emotion fills my heart even though the story is four years old. He said these words to me, Don, I would have liked to have met that man. And I realized that I missed it. I was so wrapped up in my conflicted internal religious culture that I wasn't listening to him. I was trying to respond without listening to him. I'm going to mess it up when I respond without listening to him. I got out of the line at Starbucks. I jumped back in my truck. I ran around the corner looking for this guy. Man, I would have bought him a six-pack and taken him to the park and listened to his story. I had time. I'm telling you that the word was in me and the spirit was on me to find this guy. I was passionate to find him, and he's gone. The opportunity is missed. But it prepped me for the next time. It prepped me for the next time. I'm part of a group, meets at McDonald's. Some of you heard me talk about this. Brent's met some of my friends. Isn't Brent awesome? Can I just say I love working with this guy? I do. We're, we don't live that far away from one another, and we commute out to the network office, you know, probably half a dozen times a month together, and it is so much fun watching him lead. You don't know how gifted you are to have this kind of a leader leading you. So tell him that. Okay? It won't swell his head. I'll take care of that part. You do the other part. <laughs> so I go to McDonald's, and I'm part of a group. I got inducted into this group. And we, we sit at individual booths. You can't sit with anybody. You have to sit in your own booth. That's one of the rules. It, they're not written down anywhere, but if you sit with anybody, they just stare at you till you move, and so I get that. So a few years ago, I was writing this book. Some of you are in my session. I mentioned it. And it, McDonald's has decent coffee and free internet. And so I'm an early riser. I get up there and I would work for, a, I don't know, a number of hours anyway. And this guy sat across the table from me. His name was Carl. And we started talking a little bit. And he started using recovery language. And I understand recovery language, been in recovery. And some of you know what that is. And, and, uh, and I picked up on that. And I said, tell me, tell me your, your story. How long have you been clean? And he said, you know, I've been clean for X number of years. And he said, I lived with 11 women. I've been married to three of them. I uh, watched my father kill himself when I was seven years old. And it just threw me into it. I was in the military. I've been in and out of jail. I've made so much money. And right now, he said, I just have nothing. And I'm happy with that because I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. But he said, I, I don't know what my purpose is. And then he looks at me and he says, I don't know why I'm telling you all this BS. But he doesn't say BS. He says what it stands for. And he's just there. I just can't say that because, you know, cultural conflictedness. All right, you get it. So, um, <laughs> I, and, and, and he just starts pouring his heart out to me. And he stops and he says, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. And I said, well, I, I, I don't either. We've been together now for about three or four weeks because I was doing a series at my church on the nine arts of spirituality, the nine spiritual arts that you have to, first you notice people. Then you begin to pray for the people that you notice. And, and there were nine of those things. So I wanted to practice them. And I found myself in this conversation with Carl. Well, after about eight months of going back and forth, we got this little booklet from Rick Warren. And I said, you read a few pages, underline anything that stands out to you. We'll come back and talk about it. And then we would pray at the end. And I loved the way that he prayed. After he'd come to Christ, he would pray. I said, I, you don't ask them if they want to pray. You just say, let's pray. Do you want to pray first or you want me to? You just assume. Because they're, they're willing to do whatever, you know. And, and he said, all right, I'll pray after you. And I, I would pray. And he would pray like this. He says, um, uh, well, God, this is Carl. And Don's done, so it's my turn. And I just want to thank you. And he would talk about that. And he said, uh, Don said that I don't have to, you know, give you any BS. I just tell you straight up the way it is. And I'd never heard anybody use four-letter words in a prayer. Okay. <laughs> But Carl did. He's just that real and that raw. And, and here's the deal. You can call him out or you can listen to him. And I don't think Jesus was calling Carl out. I think Jesus was happy Carl was calling on him. 
And I realized in that moment that I was connecting to someone. I'd missed it at Starbucks, but connected at McDonald's. You just never know when you're going to connect. About a month later, Carl says, can I talk with you? We can't talk in front of Jerry or uh, there's another guy named Don. There's several other, half the group is homeless. The other half's retired. And we don't talk a bunch in front of them, you know. We do other stuff. And then we have our real discipleship moments on the way out when we pray together in the parking lot. And he said, I want to walk out with you. And he said, my friend Paul, will you go see my friend Paul? He's in the hospital and he's dying. He's only got a couple days left. I said, well, Carl, I could go, but I don't know him. He said, I'm supposed to go on. I said, I think you are. He led Paul to Christ. He led him in the hospital. He just because just he's my friend. He said, let me tell you about my new friend. And Paul says, I knew something's different. He says, it's about Jesus. And he just prayed with him, and Paul died at peace. Three months later, he led Betty to Christ in the hospital on her deathbed. And it happened again with another woman named Dick, Dixie. That, you know, and he, he comes back, and he goes, I don't want to lead people to Jesus and just have them die. He said, I'm not happy with this new ministry that God gave me. (laughs) New Christians are so much fun. Do you have any new Christians in your life? Connecting to the world means that you connect the world to Jesus because that's what we're called to do. In John 17, Jesus said, in the same way that you, he's praying to the Father, gave me a mission in the world. I am giving them a mission. You know what the difference between a mission and a ministry is? Ministry is focused to believers. It's necessary. It's needed. But a mission is focused to lost people, and it's needed. Both are good. Because you're a professional, we focus on the ministry, and we forget the mission. And if you don't focus on the mission as well as the ministry, pretty soon you're not going to be very good at ministry. I thought so too. (laughs) It's important that we balance it out. Acts 20, 24. The most important thing is that I complete my mission. This is Paul. The work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. Jesus said, John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Can I just tell you that you will be a better leader if you hang around people who swear a little bit, whose life is filled with hopelessness, who don't know their eternal future. You are the light carrier and you are to be sent into darkness. We're going to have to get real comfortable at being uncomfortable. I must make Jesus known to the world because he loves the world. He's connected to the world. Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Do you know what a witness is? You ever been to a courtroom and a witness? I got to be on a jury one time. Ended up being the jury foreman. It was a lot of interesting events. And they would call witnesses forward. Witnesses do one thing. They simply tell what they saw. They tell what they heard. That's all they do. Jesus is calling us to be his witness. Jesus is not asking us to be his defense attorney. We do not need to defend him. He's not asking us to be the prosecuting attorney. We don't force people. No one ever came to Christ through logic. Now, I appreciate apologetics. I enjoy that. I like systematic theology. I like when it all fits together and and it makes sense and all the pieces come into play. But logic doesn't win people to Christ. Faith does. And the Holy Spirit, through his word, is what births that inside their heart. You're not Christ's salesman. You're not to talk people into that. You're to simply be a witness and tell what you know. Now, if I had time, here's what I would do. I would have you all stand, choose a partner, and say, you have 60 minutes to give your faith story. It's like an elevator speech. Can you give your faith story in 60 minutes? The best way to learn how to do that, and all of you better be ready to do this, Because the Holy Spirit will make sure you have an opportunity sometime in the near future because you sat in the class and got light. You are responsible for the light that's been given you. How can you tell people about what Jesus has done for you in the time that it takes to go from the ground floor to the fourth floor? About 60 seconds. Slow elevator. Write it out. Be ready to do that. 
A witness never says in a courtroom, well, you'll know my story by my good life. They open their mouth. Do not believe the lie that God will only use the way you live. Of course he'll use your good works. I get that. Ephesians 2 says you were created for good works, to help people. I get that. Matthew 25 tells us to do that. Those are important. The problem comes when we believe that we can do good works and not open our mouth. Now you're in denial. Now you're in deception. Because you don't belong to yourself. When you came to Jesus, you gave your life away. Jesus gave his life for you, and when you came to him, you gave your life away. It's like a blank check. He can spend your life any way he wants to, including telling you when to speak up. You have to be prepared to talk. We're going to connect to the world. Let me give you three ways that we connect to the world. Write down three words if you're taking notes. Three words, very simple. Share, dare, and care. Share, dare, and care. I must share with those in my world. I must dare to reach beyond my world. And I must care about the whole world. Jesus said in Acts 1.8 that we are to go to Samaria. We are to go to Judea excuse me, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Those three categories. Three places. Judea. I need to be prepared to talk about Jesus to the people closest to me. That's your Jerusalem. And right on the heels of the holidays, do you not think for a moment the Holy Spirit's going to bring some people in your life that need to hear about the gospel? Your Jerusalem. We're to go to Judea and Samaria. Those are people that are near me, but they're different. They're different. There's more than just a little bit of tension in our world right now. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, says that Christ broke down the middle wall of partition, putting to death the hostility that separated us. Let's follow Jesus and put hostility to death by choosing to go to our Judea and our Samaria and talk with people who are different than us, whose language is different, whose skin color is different, whose background is different, whose religion is different. It's an interesting thing in the history of the United States because every time we go to war with somebody, we open up our border and then immigrate a lot of those people. And in the 1950s, the early 1950s, late 1940s, the government, the emerging government of Japan called on America and said, the Japanese people are wide open. Their gods have been destroyed. They are open to evangelism. Please send us missionaries. And the United States American Christian denominations did not respond. So Japan took on a new God called materialism. Now the peoples of the world are coming here. You're going to have more Muslim based families in your neighborhood than you have ever seen before. And there's more coming. You're going to have to get comfortable at talking to people who dress differently than you. Helping them. Encouraging them. Is it possible that we could follow Jesus into diversity and put to death the hostility that separates us? I'm just telling you, when you came to Jesus, you gave your life away. We're to go to the ends of the earth. We're to help anyone. You cannot say, I'm only helping in Jerusalem or Jerusalem and Judea. No, it's and. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part. I was so glad to hear missions talked about on this stage because if you don't have a heart for the world, you won't care about your neighbor. Yep. Ephesians 3.11, it was God's plan for all history which he carried out through Jesus Christ to win the world. 
Jesus started on this mission of connecting the world to God. And you and I are following him to continue on that mission. Let's talk about that. Luke 8, 39. Jesus said, go back home and tell the people how much God has done for you. So the man went over the town, throughout the town, telling how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus healed this man, and Jesus said, don't keep quiet about it this time. Go and tell what God has done. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you and I as followers of him, that we are called to talk to people and go beyond our comfort zone. Gallup poll, 65 million Americans have no church home, and the number is rising. 34, of the, 34 million of those Americans would go to church if asked. But here's the tricky part. They will say yes after they have been asked three times. Are you willing to endure three rejections so that you get a sale on the fourth one? I have to be willing to endure rejection just like Jesus endured rejection so that I can connect to the world. My guess is that a lot of those people live near you because it's not an accident that you're in the apartment or the house that you're in, that you work where you work, you live where you live. Jesus put you there. You are under assignment. 1 Peter 3.15, be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that is in you. You know when you get to heaven, there are two things you're not going to be able to do. You're not going to be able to sin, and you're not going to be able to share the good news with anybody else. So why do you think God has left you here on planet Earth? It's not for the first reason to sin. It's for the second reason, so you and I can connect to the world and connect the world to Jesus. You and I are the adapters. We're the friends. If I took a survey right now, every single one of you know between six and ten people that you see on a regular basis, people at work, People who work on your car, grocery clerks, whoever it is, you see them on a regular basis. Are you willing to begin to notice them, pray for them, talk to them? 2 Peter 3, 9. God does not want anyone to be lost. He wants all people to change their hearts and their lives. God is not willing that anyone should perish. And as long as there is one person on the earth, that is headed towards a dark eternity, the Holy Spirit's going to be using whoever is available to reach that person. I just came back from a, a conference where I heard amazing missions stories of people, entire communities that were connected to Hamas coming to Christ. And when the elders came and pushed on the people, they said, why are you becoming Christians? This is exactly what they said. We are not Christians, we're Jesus people. Now, I haven't heard that term since the 60s, but it made it, I can't even tell you the name of the country because it, the story can't get out. But they are coming to Jesus. They call themselves the Jesus people, and he is totally changing their lives. If he is doing that behind these closed societies, what will he do through you in an open society? Number two, I must dare to reach beyond my world. I have to be willing to go beyond my comfort zone, beyond my language that I'm comfortable with, beyond the educational differences, the skin color. In a practical sense, there's a scientific thing to this. It's called expenditure of cognitive energy. It's easier for me to talk to a white American 60-something male that likes to fish for salmon. Because I like to do that. We could talk for hours. It's much more difficult for me to talk to a 30-something from Indonesia. So a number of years ago, my wife and I made the decision to open up our home to foreign students. We've had over 100 foreign students from all over the world live with us. I have two Chinese boys at home right now that are living with us. They've been with us for about three years. It's where I got my son-in-law. My oldest daughter married one of our students. How's that for a scary path? <laughs> I'm telling you, Brenda and I did some time on our knees over that one. My son-in-law, Takashi, loves Jesus with all his heart, is an elder at his church now, but I remember the time that he came to Christ, and it never would have happened if we hadn't obeyed the Holy Spirit to go beyond our comfort zone and care 
about the world and dare to go beyond our own comfort zone. 2 Corinthians 9.22, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with them so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. Galatians 2.6, stoop down, reach out to those who are oppressed, share the burdens, and so complete Christ's law. James 1.27, real religion, the kind that passes muster before God, the Father is this, reach out to the homeless and the loveless in their plight. Where would Jesus be if he were walking on planet Earth today? Can I suggest to you that he would know the address of every AIDS and hospice shelter in your city? that he would know where the pain is. This year at Network Conference, I have a friend of mine who pastors a large church, thousands, 4,000 people. And God so burdened him with the plight of the homeless that without telling anybody, he walked out of his office one day with a backpack, a sleeping bag, a cell phone, and that's it. He didn't have a change of clothes. He didn't have any money. And he lived on the streets of this large American city for two weeks. And then came back and told his church about how God had used him. Because there is this invisible wall. I'm just not comfortable. We've become very comfortable at saying the words, I'm just not comfortable. And the Holy Spirit wants to disrupt our comfort for the sake of people who are going to hell. Which do you think is more uncomfortable? Your discomfort or hell? It's an easy equation. God has no problem bringing a little pain into our life if it diverts someone else's eternal destiny away from hell. I have no problem doing that either. Matthew 25, 35 and 36. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. They said to the Lord, when did we do any of that? And he said, as much as you did it for the least of these, you were doing it for me. The eternal rewards of simply being obedient are incredible. If I'm going to connect to the world, I have to be willing to share with those who are in my world. I have to be willing to dare to go beyond my own comfort zone in my world. And here's the third one. I've got to care about the whole world. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. Now, Jesus said that to his followers. He didn't say it to missionaries and pastors. He didn't say it to professional ministers, people who were paid to be good Christians. He said it to his followers. You and I are followers. We're to go all around the world. And when Jesus said this, it was physically impossible for them to get around the whole world. They didn't even know what the world looked like at that point. Today, we've got planes, trains, and automobiles. We can go anywhere we need to. The world is at our fingertips. You can quite literally go on the internet and talk to anybody around the world sharing Christ in some chat rooms. I would challenge you to find a way to take the message and connect to your world. Mark 8, 35, Jesus said, if you insist on saving your life, you will lose it. Only those who throw their lives away for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to really live. Is Jesus lying at that point? I want to submit to you that he is telling us the truth of what it takes to connect to our world and to connect our world to God. There's a story of an American pastor who was uh, in China doing some undercover missions work, and he found himself in the home of a communist professor. He began to have conversations, philosophical, religious conversations. And they're talking about what a living faith in Jesus is like. And the communist professor is trying to understand it from a logical point of view. So the pastor backed up and he said, let me tell you a story. I took my son to a carnival and I told him that he could bring two or three of his friends. I bought a roll of tickets and at every one of the rides in the carnival, I would hand out a ticket to my son and then to all of his friends. And at the third ride, I looked down, and instead of there being four little boys, there were five. 
And I said, who are you? And he told me his name. I said, why are you here? And he said, your son told me that if I was his friend, you would give me a ticket too. And the pastor turned with that very simple presentation of the gospel and said to that communist professor, my heavenly father will give you a ticket just like he gave me a ticket. And he prayed with him in that moment. I walked back from a seminar like this and I began to talk to my Chinese boys about how many missionaries there are in China and they couldn't believe it. He said, no, there are no Christian missionaries in our whole country. I said, there really are. There's at least 200 just from our organization as well. Now they're serving your country. They work in manufacturing and in training, in industry, in teaching English. They're in all these different facets, but they're there as representatives of Jesus. And he turned to me and he said, why have you never talked to me about Jesus before? Called me out. I said, Vincent, you're right. We should talk. He said, good, not now. That's code for, we've broken the ice and I don't want to go any further. Are, are you tracking with me here? Okay, now if I would have pushed on that and said, no, let's talk now. You're interested now. Let's drive for the goal line now. I would have lost him. He's not far from the kingdom. He's just not in the kingdom. He's in process. He's moving in that direction. There's no greater thrill than helping somebody walk across the line of faith. So I want to ask you a question as we wrap up. Who do you know that Jesus is burdening on your heart that you need to be willing to go out of your comfort zone and connect them? Are you willing to connect to their world? If you're working with somebody who's hurt you and you become bitter, are you willing to ask them to forgive you or to offer your forgiveness to them? To be reconciled, to make an amends, however it takes. Is there somebody that you just don't like? And God says, that's the one I want you to begin to pray for. If you're here and you know that the Holy Spirit is talking to you about one or two people, maybe even three or four, that are in your mind right now, the first names are, I'm not going to ask you to write anything down, I'm not going to call you forward, but here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. I'm going to have you stand to your feet right now with every head up, every eye open, everybody looking all around. I want to call you out. If you know who Jesus is asking you simply to notice and begin to pray for and be willing to connect to their world, I want you to stand to your feet right now. I'm going to pray for you. Now understand what you are doing when you stand up. You are actually making a vow to the Lord. The word says that it's better for us not to make a vow than to make a vow and break it. You are, when, you, when you stand to your feet, you are making a vow to God. You can use me however you want to reach that person. So between now and your death, you are available to reach that person. That's what you're saying. Are you ready for that? Father, you see these men and women who are standing right now. You know how many lives are represented here. You know that this is how the kingdom of God moves forward. It's not about geographical territory. It is about men and women's hearts, the hearts of children. Father, I pray that your anointing will rest upon them and that they will know, Holy Spirit, what you are specifically asking them to do before the end of this day, to send a text, to stop by and visit, to make a phone call, whatever it is. Father, I pray that you will empower them in Jesus' good name. Amen. Would the rest of you stand with me? We've got a choice. How do you know if you're willing to connect to the world or not? It's a very, very simple test. If you are still here on planet Earth, then the answer is yes. God wants you to connect. There are four men in the Bible that represent a response to Jesus. Four different responses. You and I can be like Moses when God called him and he said, who, me? You can be like Jonah when God called him. He said, not me. You can be like Habakkuk when God called him. He said, why, me? Or you can be like Isaiah when God called him. He said, send me. That's my prayer. Father, I pray that as we influence young lives here, 
that these leaders will be influenced, that we will never settle, that we will understand that we can only train others as we are trained ourselves. We open our hearts to be used by you to effectively connect to our world so that we can connect our world to you. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brent, come on up.